Good day, everyone. How are you? Hello, everyone. Hello, viewers. Hello. Um, greetings. Um, good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening, depending on where you're watching us from. Uh, pleasant welcome to Health Talk. And I am your lead host, Isaac Yami. And um, today I'm going to be joined by my other co host, Gami, and uh, like always, our presenter. Uh, Dr. Tomayo. And at this very point, I'll ask um, Kami to introduce himself and welcome everyone who's watching us just now. Hello, everyone. Good day to you, wherever you are in the world. Today, this is afternoon here in uh, England. I am uh, broadcasting from the West Midlands here in the UK. It's just a pleasure to be joining you again. Uh, the, again, as I say, the, the days are just breezing by. It's, you know, this, it seems yesterday when we had wonderful presentation, Isaac, you remember. And now it's yes. uh, it's our health talk again. So uh, with greetings coming from England, we welcome you for this um, afternoon's or today's session. Awesome. And uh, also, um, I'm going to introduce someone else who's also going to join us on the co-host panel and is a member of Jesus Life and is uh, Pastor Maxwell, my brother. Maxwell, say hello to everyone and where you're joining us from. Hello, everyone. Um, Maxwell, I'm joining from Nigeria, Babcock University, precisely. Thank you. Nice having you here. Awesome. We're excited to have you today, my brother from Nigeria. And um, and uh, um, Gami, do you, we usually start with something, and you oh, yeah. usually, <laughs> yes, <go on. laughs> yeah, it's such a wonderful, wonderful opportunity for us to be uh, learning more about our bodies and how to take care of it. And what better way, uh, Professor Isaac, to begin every session with a word of prayer and center ourselves with the giver and the maintainer of our life? Let us bow our heads for prayer. Our gracious God, our loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this wonderful time you again have afforded us to come together. By the wonder of modern technology, we could be able to share the good news that our health can be protected and we have a solemn responsibility to take good care of them. Thank you for the discussion this afternoon and for the guidance and wisdom that we can gather from out of the discussion. Please bless the speaker and we pray that you will bless our listeners all over the world all of us will benefit from today's session. Thank you so much for hearing and answering your prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Gami. And I want to welcome again everybody who's just watching us today. And likewise, do uh, feel free to jot down your comments in our comment section, questions and everything. Be engaged, of, be, um, be engaged with us mostly because we would love to engage with you mostly. And I want to welcome everybody who started watching us right now. And um, at this very point, I will ask, um, I'll ask Gami to introduce our, our presenter as always. Yeah, um, we missed uh, Miss Grilu actually today. Uh, she has been always with us, but for, for some, uh, some reason, she cannot be able to join us. But uh, of course, uh, the other half is with us, uh, Dr. Jerry Tamayo who is also uh, one of our leading uh, facilitators in our program. Um, I would yield to Dr. Tamayo to be the one to introduce our our guest and a very special speaker uh, this afternoon. Again, she would be discussing about food additives that we need to avoid. I believe that Dr. Jerry Tamayo is uh, the best person to be introducing our speaker to us. And so, uh, Dr. Tamayo, would you have the honor of introducing our lead speaker for this evening? Yes, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, be here again, here in our Health Talk presentation. I would like to greet my, uh, our lead host, uh, Professor Isaac. How are you, Professor Isaac? I'm all right, so I hope you're good. Very good, very good. And of course, uh, to uh, Mr. Gami, who has been uh, with us for, this is your fifth, fifth time or sixth, uh, sixth Mr. Gami, right? Yes. And uh, this is our 15th episode of the Health Talk, which means that we have been here for uh, more than uh, three months, going four months now. 
And of course, I would like to greet uh, Pastor Maxwell, who have joined us. And I know that he is part of the JesusLive.io, uh, who have been trained on virtual ministry. And we would like to welcome all of you as well. And of course, we welcome all our viewers. I hope that you have been learning a lot here in our Health Talk presentations. I'm coming from where now? I used to be McAllen, Texas. Of course, we are going back to McAllen, Texas. But right now we are here on the campus of Andrews University in Berrien Springs, Michigan. In time for the celebration of the Mother's Day, and importantly, the celebration of God's goodness to our daughter for her four-year degree in nutrition from Andrews University. And we are so glad that God has been so good to our family, especially to our daughter. And uh, of course, this may, not, may be belated to greet others. Uh, greetings uh, from JesusLive.io Health Talk to all mothers who celebrated their uh, Mother's Day with their families yesterday. And even now we are celebrating. And so we are so glad that we have a mother as well who is uh, going to grace our, our presentation today. And we are just so fortunate to have her. She is so busy, I know, but she gave us the time for Health Talk. Since uh, she is now officially part of the Health Talk team, we would like to welcome her in our presentation. And she will be here with us for many more presentations. So before we allow her to speak, all right, may I have her uh, be introduced to our uh, audience all over the world. So. Uh, Dr. Shireen, we are addressing the global community, which means that uh, we have uh, all our viewers around the world, uh, from the US to Africa, to Europe, and uh, to all other parts of the world. In Asia as well, there are a lot of them. Uh, the Asian countries, many of them are listening and viewing all our presentations. So I would like to just uh, shortly introduce uh, Dr. Shireen. Uh, Dr. Shireen is a native uh, New Yorker who is uh, now the department chair and professor of nutrition, dietetics, and public health at Oakwood University in Huntsville, Alabama. Alabama. And she provides leadership, vision, and direction for the department while providing instruction in courses central to plant-based vegetarian or vegan nutrition and public health. I like that. And uh, you know, Dr. Shireen uh, is uh, a, a, uh, an alumna of Oakwood University where she had uh, done, she did her Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry and of course, uh, from there, she went up to the ladder of education such that Dr. Fraser uh, completed, completed her PhD at Harvard University in Boston, Massachusetts. So, so we are just so glad that uh, we have a, a graduate from Harvard University, a Adventist scientist who is with us. Um, so uh, it, that's in Harvard University in Biological Sciences in Public Health with a concentration in nutritional biochemistry as well. Her expertise is in lipid, cholesterol metabolism, cardiovascular disease prevention, plant-based nutrition, and genetic epidemiology. You see, there are some common terms that we are uh, together here and uh, she is also a registered dietitian nutritionist. She is an RD, RDN, and certified personal trainer, author, speaker, and researcher. Dr. Fraser is dedicated to advancing health promotion, disease prevention, and health equity. And she is married to Dr. Handel Fraser, and Dr. Fraser enjoys the outdoors traveling the arts, bonfires, serving her church, 
and is spending time with family. Her proudest achievement is being a mommy to her precious five-year-old daughter, Samantha. In fact, I've met both of them when I was in Loma Linda University together with some health leaders around the world. We uh, met for the first time, although it seems that we have been long friends when we yeah. met because at the time uh, we were uh, we were trying to convince her to be part of our our health uh, team at Edinburgh Church but then uh, it's it's now time Dr. Fraser that uh, we are together here in this presentation and uh, happy mother's day Dr. Shireen we are so glad that you are here so let me um, have Dr. Shireen uh, be uh, on the uh, on view right now. Oh, thank you. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Wonderful. Oh, this, what a beautiful introduction. Thank you so much, Dr. Tamayo, for your kind and gracious introduction and invitation and continued partnership to be part of Jesus Live Health Talk. And it's really a privilege. And I'm just glad we were finally able to connect, even though through the years we were attempts. And so glad we were able to touch ground. I So thank you. And first, thank the Lord for this opportunity. And I bring you greetings from beautiful Huntsville, Alabama in the Tennessee Valley at Oakwood University. Uh, we bring you warm welcomes. And again, happy belated Mother's Day. I would be remiss to say that because without mothers, there would be no us. So I want to wish all the mothers around the world globally, you are just wonderful. And we thank you for being mothers. And thank you to, um, I wanted to say a few thanks again, Dr. Tamara, for your in, for the invitation. And I would also like to thank Professor Isaac for his hosting, as well as Mr. Gammy for his work, and Wells Pastor Mac, and as well as Ms. Grilu as well, who may not be here at this time, for your commitment to such an important um, program, Jesus Live. I love it. I love it because he is alive and he continues to be. Um, I think that's all I'm gonna say at this time. I think I can go ahead and get started. Um, I'm glad I'm addressing a global community, even though I'm a New Yorker natively, I feel that my background is eclectic globally. My dad is from uh, Charlotte, South Carolina. I should say Charlotte, North Carolina, born in South Carolina. My mother, so I, I grew up eating a lot of great food from that area, and then my mother's from Central America. She's from Panama. So we grew up hearing Spanish in the house, coupled with Southern, so my mom being from um, Central America and grandparents who also lived with us from um, the island of Jamaica and they moved to build the Panama Canal. So I tell people all the time I grew up eating the best Spanish, Caribbean and American food and had interesting heated dialogues around the table when it came to food from different parts of the world. So again, thank you for this opportunity and I'm gonna dive right in if I may do so with my talk. Yes, please go ahead, Dr. Fantastic. Shereen. All right, I was invited to speak about food additives um, and that can avoid. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen at this time. All right. Very good. Please just let me know that you can see the slide, the first slide before I begin. Yes, we can. Fantastic, fantastic. Now food additives are everywhere and I thought it would be, in sharing some of my thoughts and ideas to kind of give a little bit of a background on actually what are food additives. Before we delve into the ones to avoid, I always like to create a baseline for the definition. So for centuries, you know, for millennium, food additives historically have been used to do a few things, to, to prefer, preserve the taste, improve the texture, nutrition, and appearance of food. So there was a key goal for food additives. And even more so in the centuries, it's been to prevent foodborne illnesses. There are such as E. coli, as well as um, several others. Food additives have been known to help um, be a public health effort as well. Another key reason or for what food additives have been used for in the past is to en enable transportation of food to far areas that otherwise may not have received those particular types of food. So those are some other areas for why food additives are needed. And Fourthly, food additives have been used to actually help manufacture standard quality products so that foods can be reproducible for time to meet standard quality consistency. So when foods are made over and over and over again, you want to have that same standard. We call that batch to batch quality and ensuring that those batch qualities are maintained. And so these are some of the areas of why what are food additives for texture, nutrition, preventing illness, foodborne illnesses, 
making sure that individuals who are in remote areas can get the food and making sure that there's consistency in uh, the usage and batch quality. So again, what are food additives? Just giving some more his context for it. So the United States Food and Drug Administration, and I know throughout the world there are different um, types of organizations, but I come through the lens of the FDA's uh, food additive evaluation, especially since I was an interdisciplinary scientist at the FDA at some point in my career where I worked in the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition at the FDA um, some years back while I worked on the Hill. And so I thought it was important to put this in context for, you know, in the area of food additives. And so the FDA and I learned a lot, quite honestly. I had some interesting uh, ideas of, of FDA prior to, and I learned a tremendous amount while I was there. And there's a term called GRASS. And GRASS, the FDA means generally recognized as safe. And they work with how they regulate which foods can get certain additives and which ones don't. And what are the maximum amount of food additives that can be included um, without, in essence, causing harm or maintaining what we call generally recognized as safe or the acronym GRASS. And and this is also important because it's important to know how to, the FDA also is involved with ensuring that you can identify the food additives that are on the food label. And you may or may not be aware of this, but the FDA maintains a very robust database of over 4,000 or close to 4,000 ingredients, and they call this substances added to foods. Okay. And that's, you know, the FDA generally recognizes safe. So what are some commonly used food add additives? Before we get to the ones to avoid, I thought it was important to establish what are some commonly used ones, and then we'll get to the ones to avoid. So what are they and what do they do? So one type of food additive, they actually are called pH control agents. And they do just that. They control the pH of foods. They actually alter the texture, the taste, the safety, but they control the base and the acid base ratio or the acidity and alkalinity of foods. And when you change and you control the pH of foods, it can actually change the texture and how it, the mouth feel. For example, jams, ice creams, candies, gelatins, for example, have uh, are very important in having pH control agents because it will determine whether the food becomes a jam or not, or get in a jam for lack of better fruit terms. Another type of commonly used food additive are called anti-caking agents. And they're added to sugar products, milks, eggs, egg mixes, for example. And the whole idea of anti-caking agents are just what it sounds like. They prevent caking. They prevent the lumping, the sticking together. And some common ones are calcium phosphates, which obviously you can see I have calcium inside of them as well as a phosphorus group. And they or silicon dioxide and stearic acid, which are long chain um, compounds. Another commonly used food add additive are called emulsifiers. And emulsifiers are actually pretty cool. So when you, we all know that oil and water don't mix together, but, and many times we don't want them to mix, but in many cases we actually do. So for example, in vinegar um, salad dressings, for example. So what emulsifiers actually do is that they keep oil and water together. They actually keep both compounds together and not separating. So for example, mayonnaise is an ideal example of a product that has an emulsifier in it. Normally again, or egg yolk, for example, the less lecithin from the egg yolk um, and soybeans are also common emulsifiers. They allow oils and water waters to come together and stay, um, stay mixed together. You always know when a product on the shelf, let's say in the grocery store, wherever you're purchasing foods, um, like say a salad dressing or mayonnaise or any similar kind of food product, you'll know when the emulsifier has gone bad or has degraded when you can actually see the separation. And so again, that's one commonly used food additive, emulsifier. Another commonly used food additive and what they do are humectants. They keep foods moist. Um, honey is a very common example of what is traditionally known. Glycerin is another. Then we get into other more um, refined type of sugars called sugar poly polyols. They usually have um, a six carbon compound structure and they're used in shredded coconut candies or marshmallows, glycoline pri um, propylene glycol um, is one of a humectant as well. Not one I'm a fan of, um, but it is considered a humectant. But honey is what's considered a very common and popular one. Okay, just go through a couple of more of some common food additives and what they do. They're stabilizers, thickeners, and gelling agents. And I men again, I mentioned these because these are found kind of ubiquitously throughout the food supply. They're uh, widely used across food products. And again, stabilizers or thickeners or gelling agents are just what they sound like. They thicken um, food products. Yogurt is a common one. They create this uniform texture. 
and they prevent emulsions. Uh, you don't want separation or little you know, beads of oil when you are um, creating certain food products. So stabilizers, thickeners, uh, particularly are improve the stability of foods. And again, that's another common type of food additive. And some examples of the stabilizers and thickeners that are used in commonly used food are arrowroot, corn starch, potato starch, for example, um, vegetable gums, locust bean. These are some common ones that are starch based. Then there's some protein based thickeners, such as collagen, egg white, and gelatin. And then there are polysaccharide thickeners, agar, 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 car carrageen, algae, and seedweed, and then pectin, which is um, actually one of my favorite, and the apple and citrus fruits. And those tend to be the least processed. But these are just, again, commonly used food additives that are within many um, food supplies throughout the, throughout the world, actually. Okay. And then I think this is the last one, then there are leavening agents, um, where leaven is actually in the word of God. And so this is one that has deep connections to, to uh, spiritual context. They increase volume. Leavening agents actually raise um, the volume of foods or the shape and the texture. They create a more um, appealing mouthful. They're found in doughs and, ba and um, batters, for example, baking powder, yeast, and yogurt. So leavening agents are another common type of food additive. Okay. So now that we've covered just some basic ground on what are some traditional common food additives, now let's get to the seven food additives to avoid. Okay, are you ready? All right, let's go through seven. And this is not exhaustive, there are many others, but I thought these were seven that would be important to showcase. Bisphenols or BPA, you've heard quite a bit now. You say bisphenols are not in food. Well, actually, they are more so in waters or plastic. So it's kind of discovered um, best phenols in the 1960s, excuse the typo, there's an extra zero there, but it's the 1960s. And it's a double phenol ring compound that has two methyl groups and two um, hydroxy groups on the side. And it's known, one common best phenol is BPA. And they're found commonly in plastics and epoxy resins. And we traditionally seen them in baby bottles, sippy cups, um, most popular in the lining of um, food cans, like you know, canned beans or canned vegetables or canned fruits. Um, and one that's that many people may not be aware of are the cash receipt receipts. And I thought this was interesting because when my daughter was very young, she, before I was aware of this, she loved to touch, she just liked the feel of uh, receipts from the store. And I thought that was really odd. And, but I'm thankful that I found out that as much as she enjoyed like touching, I said, let me find an alternative here because you know these register receipts are a source of, of BPA. Um, but this is also, these recommendations specifically for BPA are, are also approved by the um, American Academy of Pediatrics because they recognize that BPA has a very deleterious adverse effect on hormone levels and can interfere with puberty and fertility of our um, young children. And so we want to stay away and avoid BPA at all costs, specifically because BPA can interfere with puberty. It can act um, like a estrogenic, it has estrogenic effects, and it can result in increasing body fat, affect the immune system and nervous system, which is why BPA has been banned. And you will, one thing again, I will recommend, and I'll talk later, is that you'll start, you're starting to see a lot more canned foods that'll say BPA free, or um, you know, you'll see similar like BPA and cross through. So avoid BPA at all costs. Um, we also see it in our you know, water bottles, which is why it's important to make sure you're looking at the labels on the water bottles that say BPA free. Number two, artificial food colors. This is also a biggie and has huge effects, particularly on um, young children, even adolescents. Now, food colors brighten the appearance of everything from candies to condiments, even drinks and juices that are there, which is why uh, you'll hear me say over and over again, it's so important to read the labels, but artificial food, so food coloring itself is not bad. It's the artificial food coloring that can be detrimental. And there are specific ones that you really want to avoid. Um, if you notice here, I see it shows some Cheerios that are there. I'm sorry, I probably shouldn't say the company name there, but nevertheless, um, a cereal that has a, um, you know, color of Fruit Loops. Uh, there's actually, I believe Cheerios has actually done a great job in changing their product, uh, their ingredient list, and including things like carrot juice and beet juice. And some other companies have done the same where they're using food coloring, but using the food coloring based in um, vegetable sources like beet juice to create the red, carrot juice to create the orange, um, pineapple juice to create the yellow. So you want to look for the ones on the label to avoid that say blue number one, red 40, or yellow five and six, because they can cause some re allergic reactions. But more specifically, we see the yellow five and six 
being one of the worst because it can also trigger asthma as well as other headaches and um, other challenges. Whereas red three is also very dangerous because we've seen to have to have risk on thyroid tumors in some animal studies. And we've seen some of them also in human studies. And why this is important because thyroid regulates our metabolism and other hormones. And so that can be very dangerous as well. So artificial food colors, try to avoid at all costs, try to, it's particularly these. And look for food coloring if you want if you want to have food coloring that are more vegetable based. Okay. And we also noted noted that a couple other studies have shown that food artificial food colors can promote hyperactivity in children and can actually be more symptomatic of ADHD um, in children. So again, these are some other reasons. There's several others, but these are just ones I'd like to highlight. Number three. MSG, monosodium glutamate. Now, MSG is also a very common food additive. It really has intensifies flavor and texture of savory dishes, and it's found um, in many groups. Um, and so we have to be very careful though with MSG because it acts like not so much a salt, but it has this really intense way to add flavor and texture. Um, it's found in many frozen dinners, salty snacks, canned foods, and certain ethnic foods as well. Um, we also see it at some restaurants and fast food places. And so there's the chemical structure again of the monosodium. Again, there's one sodium group, Na+, hence why it's called monosodium um, glutamate. And here are some studies that, uh, and this was, even though this was several decades ago, 1969, I thought to give some historical context of where the controversy about MSG started. It was a, a mouse, a mice study in particular, where they saw um, that large amounts, not small amounts, but large amounts of MSG caused some really adverse neurological brain um, effects and impaired uh, brain growth in mice. But what they found more recently was that MSG does not cross the blood brain barrier, a study in 2009 by Hawkins. So it doesn't cross the blood brain barrier, uh, but but there, it's, there's still some controversy about it because there have also been recent studies that have associated MSG with weight gain and metabolic syndrome. And what metabolic syndrome is, it's the intersection where a patient has um, type two diabetes, they, or I should say they have high blood sugar, high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and high visceral fat. And all of those, um, those four um, symptoms are associated with uh, metabolic syndrome, which leads to high risk of heart disease, high risk of type 2 diabetes. And again, that's you know, hypertension, high blood sugar, high cholesterol, and visceral fat, which is fat around the abdominal area. But here's what uh, is, has become the more common concern with MSG is this what we call MSG sensitivity. And it elevates blood pressure and causes headaches and sweating and numbness and even nausea and breathing problems. And some of these happen individually, some of them happen collectively. And so this is one of the reasons why I highly recommend avoiding MSG because you just never know how sensitive you are, where you are on the spectrum. You know, is it going to cause some blood pressure and headache or will it cause sweating and numbness or will it cause nausea and breathing? So because you don't know, it's better to just abstain altogether if you're able to. Number four, nitrates. So nitrates are commonly known as stabilizers. And nitrate, you can see the word in there, it is nitrogen. So nitrogen is not a bad thing, but the nitrates create challenges. Um, they are used as to, keep, to preserve food and enhance color, particularly in processed meats. Um, they are the most common processed foods overall, but particularly processed meats. And the reason why nitrates are used is because they actually uh, retard bacterial growth. They prevent and um, stop harmful bacterial growth. And that's the key word, harmful bacterial growth. As all bacteria isn't bad, it's the harmful bacteria that wants, we want to remove. And so that's why nitrates are used. Um, unfortunately, however, nitrates can interfere with thyroidal function and inhibit the body's ability to deliver oxygen to the body. And of course, we never want to tamper with um, minimizing oxygen delivery because we need it for our brain to function, for our lungs, obviously just for life. And so um, that's one of the challenges with nitrates. And we've seen in some studies where um, nitrates can increase the risk of certain cancers, and that's where we want to be careful there. Oops. Okay, But here's one of the biggest concerns with nitrates. Now, so when you cook, meats in particular at very high temperature. And I know I'm talking to a global population here, and this can be you know, 
particularly the red meats, but all meats in particular, but red meats especially, when you cook them at high, high temperatures, coupled with the high pH and the acid in the stomach, it produces a compound called nitrosamines, you see there. And so these nitrosamines are very dangerous and increases risk of pancreatic and colon cancer collectively, um, respectively. You know, pancreatic cancer has a very fortunate, um, you know, very at prognosis. And so it, it really, makes things worse for lack of better words there. So again, nitrate's really not good and what exacerbates it even more so is when you heat these meats to higher temperatures and the interaction um, in the gut and how it uh, increases the risk of those two cancers. Number five, sulfites. Now sulfites are just what it sounds like, sulfur, um, sulfur, sulfites. Now sulfites are, act as, are known commonly in preservatives and they're common actually in a lot of dried fruits. Fortunately, now there are different ways. There's some companies that are kind of going away from using sulfites and dried fruits, but we see them sometimes on um, on actually whole foods fruits, uh, kind of kind of as a covering. But it's also very common in wines, um, and we just need to be very careful because they can actually act activate or aggravate, excuse me, asthma, which is why sulfites have been bound on its use in fresh fruits and vegetables in the United States. And you want to read the label. Anytime you see the word sulfite, such as sulfur dioxide, potassium bisulfite, sodium bisulfite, sulf sodium bisulfite, these are additives that you really want to avoid. And I'm a big fan of like trail mix and, you know, dried fruit sometimes in the winter time, or even just, you know, going on a hike, I love the outdoors. You want to, you know, have some, you know, dried fruit with you. There are sources where you can, and reading the label that do not have sulfites in them. And sometimes it's hard to find, but again, you want to try to minimize the intake of, of um, sulfites. Number six, high fructose corn syrup. And this has been, uh, you know, debate for quite a bit of time. You know, it's a sweetener. High fructose corn syrup is just what it sounds like. You know, high fructose, fructose being a monosaccharide, a simple sugar coming from corn. Uh, and so it's found in many, many products, sodas, juices, candies, breakfast, cereal, snack foods. And again, it's a simple sugar called fructose. And if you notice in there, there's the word fruit. So fructose is the simple sugar found in fruit. And God designed it that way. He wanted foods to not only be savory, but wanted them to taste sweet as well. And so the natural fructose in fruits are wonderful. But when we, when we, tweak the chemistry of the fructose and create a high fructose corn syrup and make, we actually intensify almost 10 times the sugar con um, the sugar um, experience in essence. Individuals, you know, when you, for example, have just corn by itself versus high fructose corn syrup, the sweetness is much higher. Or for example, if you were to have um, a salad dressing with or without, you can taste the difference or a juice that has high fructose corn syrup versus 100% juice. You can taste the intense difference in the sweetener um, that's in high fructose corn syrup. And it's changing our palate to want foods that are much sweeter. Like for example, ketchup, do, do we need sugar and ketchup? No, we don't. But because um, throughout the world where there's a development for more foods that have a higher sweeter quotient, um, high fructose corn syrup is being, and it's cheap and it's inexpensive. Um, and it actually can become addictive if you're accustomed to wanting um, sweet, you know, having that sweet tooth. And one other thing I want to mention at birth, uh, there, one of my lectures I do with our students, I show a slide with um, the picture of newborns faces, their faces. And in essence, you see uh, what, what was done in the experiment. It wasn't so much an experiment, but they dropped, they had a little dropper and in each drop of water they gave the newborn like it was just regular water just water by itself one dropper had water with a little sugar another drop had a little water that was savory bitter sweet and you saw the facial expressions change when the newborn and i stress newborn first 30 days had that drop of just plain water drop with sugar water drop with um savory water drop with bitter drop with sour and it was so evident the neutral you know the in newborn's face was just pretty much you know neutral um savory they kind of had a smile to some, you know, it was kind of, but with the sour, you saw the, the mouth pucker up. But when they had the drop of the sweet, the water with a little sugar in, you saw the biggest smile on the face of a newborn. I share this because by default, and we won't get into the sin or not, but the reality is sweet is a natural, uh, it's kind of the first preference in taste, which is why I always recommend, I'll throw this out to parents, please introduce vegetables before introducing fruits. Introduce vegetables before introducing fruits. All right, let's move on. 
So 32 people consumed a drink sweetened with glucose or fructose over 10 weeks. And what they found is those who had the fructose sweetened beverage, um, their belly fat and blood sugar levels actually increased. Their insulin sensitivity was um, decreased, which means the insulin was not working as well. Um, high fructose can actually trigger inflammation. And we know that inflammation um, excessive can actually um, make chronic conditions like heart disease and diabetes and cancer even worse. They play a central role. And so, and high fructose corn syrup is, it has empty calories. So when you're consuming foods with high fructose corn syrup, you're not getting the added minerals and vitamins and other beneficial nutrients. You're getting empty calories. You're getting this amount of artificial energy, but not the nutrients that you need. And lastly, I left, I think I called the best for last, trans fat. Trans fat is a horrible, 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 horrible food, um, oil, oil, I should say. And it is what we call, um, it's a man-made synthetic fat, and it's what we call an unsaturated fat. And I won't go into all the chemistry of it, but I wanted to just share with you when something is saturated, if you think like a sponge, if you saturate it with, uh, you put it in water, it's saturated with water. Similar here. Um, fats that are saturated, they're saturated, they're full of hydrogens, as you can see there. And when a fat is high saturated, it simply means it's solid at room temperature. So think SNS, saturated solid. When you introduce or when you actually remove a hydrogen, when you remove a hydrogen, now it goes from saturated to unsaturated. And that's what whenever we remove a hydrogen, it goes from a solid to a liquid. So for example, Olive oil is considered an unsaturated fat. It's a very healthy fat. And so it doesn't have all the hydrogens. It removes one and it actually changes the structure of the, um, of the oil and it makes it go from solid to liquid. And then trans fat, we, it's trans because it, it, it by force had a hydrogen removed. We call it hydrogenation or partially hydrogenation. It's really forcing at high heat is why you see a fryer there at very high heat. It actually removes, takes a saturated fat or oil, I should say, an oil that was unsaturated. And at high temperatures, it creates this trans um, structure. And it, the reason why food companies enjoyed using it for many years is because when there's trans fat in foods, it improves the shelf life. So what's the big deal? I mean, what's the big deal and why is that important? Well, when you improve shelf life, the food can stay stable on the shelf for longer periods of time, which means there's more likely for consumers to purchase the product. And so it really ends up being a financial gain in that respect. And so many processed foods such as baked goods, margarine, microwave, popcorn, biscuits, cakes, cookies had um, trans fats in them for many years until recently. Um, and I was very proud to, when I worked um, Capitol Hill for some time at FDA, played a role in actually having enforcing trans fat regulation and making sure that they were moved from the marketplace. But again, trans fat is associated with higher risk of heart disease. Trans fat is the only fat that raises your bad cholesterol and lowers your good cholesterol. So it's dangerous and should be avoided at all costs and also increases inflammation. Um, and what we're also seeing in a very large study of almost 100,000 women is that trans fat also can increase type two diabetes in New England Journal of Medicine, a very reputable journal. So trans fat, we want it zero on labels. We wanna stay away from trans fats. So, and furthermore, it's been banned, which is why it, it doesn't get served at restaurants. It's pretty much banned and it's no longer generally recognized it's safe. It's been revoked. So it's pretty, pretty bad. So what do we do? Here's some quick recommendations and then we'll wrap up. Okay, buy, serve, and consume. I don't wanna just say buy and serve and consume, but more fresh fruits and vegetables. Eliminate processed meats and foods as much as pos possible. Try to minimize, avoid microwaving foods in plastic containers. We're not saying not to microwave, but not in plastic containers, please, 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 not in plastic containers. And wash plastics by hand rather, rather than putting them in dishwashers. And I know that can be challenging when you're working full time and doing a number of things, but the heat in the dishwasher can actually leach the BPA off of the plastic. So if you can try to do more hand washing of plastics, then the dishwasher would be better. Um, again, for those who do have a dishwasher, I understand I'm speaking to a global population. Um, and use more plastics, I mean, excuse me, use more glass and stainless steel if at all possible. And cut back, again, on canned foods that have BPA in them. I'm not gonna say to cut, eliminate because I understand that people throughout the world have different financial, um, are, are basically in different socioeconomic status, but look for PBA free if you're going to use canned foods, try your best. Um, read the labels, read the labels, read the labels, get to know your products. Um, and again, I've always cut back on fast foods and processed foods. And the thinking here is not to get paranoid, not to, you know, say, oh gosh, you know, I'll throw my hands up. What am I to do? It's all over. No, you know, 
read the label, be prayerful, not get paranoid, just making simple changes. And here are my references. And 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing in Jesus' life. Help talk. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Shereen. That was a very enlightening presentation. You see, I could uh, relate uh, here to uh, what uh, she's saying, basically, because uh, this is uh, probably one of the major culprits why people are getting sick. Uh, is that so? Could you elaborate more on this, uh, Dr. Shereen? As you mentioned about uh, uh, BPA, artificial uh, food coloring, and MSG nitrates, nitrites, uh, sulfites, uh, high fructose corn syrup, and uh, the trans fats, of course, uh, which we mentioned. Uh, basically, you mentioned also along with this uh, presentation, all those chronic illnesses. So that includes uh, diabetes, maybe heart disease, hypertension, coronary artery disease, allergic reactions, including asthma, uh, cancers. So you mentioned all those. Could you please elaborate a little further on this? Sure, certainly, I'd be happy to. So we know not only in the United States, but globally we are seeing increases or a shift from you know, illnesses such as malaria to chronic diseases. As our diets have changed globally, you know, becoming more westernized, we're seeing more of foods that are quickly prepared, um, more fast foods. We're seeing globally increasing and in, increases in heart disease in, in places that never had heart disease, you know, dying of more um, other types of, of illnesses, um, more micro, you know, um, bacterial or viral diseases are now becoming, maybe because wealth is increasing, but are now becoming um, more affluent in some respects and are taking on the affluent diseases. And so they're leaving the traditional foods that come with the more, the, what I call the humble traditional foods that God has given us, you know, the roots, fruits, veggie soups, you know, the, the, the traditional and are kind of connecting more so to, to wealth and are consuming foods that are more highly processed and refined because they can. And what we're seeing is that as the diet is changing globally, so are the types of illnesses such as heart disease, cancer, diabetes, um, stroke, hypertension, obesity. And I mention that because there's many factors that play a role in those major chronic diseases. Um, artificial uh, additives are one of those factors. So artificial, or I should say additives are not the only contributor. But when you have all of these other players involved that are contributing to the big five, as I call them, heart disease, cancer, stroke, type two diabetes that we're seeing, you know, throughout the world, I'll give you one example. In St. Lucia, um, I came to find out that there are five and six year olds, and, and, and this is heartbreaking, five and six year olds who are getting amputations, eight year olds, amputations because of uncontrolled type two diabetes, leaving their traditional foods and, you know, basically now taking on the more westernized eating patterns, the you know high saturated fat diets, the more um, refined sugars, the more processed cakes, cookies, pastas, and pastries. And don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that you can't have those occasionally, but when you leave your traditional, I call them the ground foods, the foods that we were designed to consume, and then you add the, um, you know, art of the, the, you know, additives to preserve, you know, to the, you create this um, storm metabolically that is becoming more and more dangerous. And when I start seeing, you know, children getting amputations, not because of a car accident or because of some type of, you know, genetic, but because of a life diet and lifestyle, because they've shifted and the parents are changing their diet. It, it's, 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 it's heartbreaking and mortifying. So sorry, that's kind of a long answer. My key point in essence, the take home message is the additives, the food additives play a critical role into the storm that's happening metabolically globally. Yeah, and you mentioned about uh, the children, uh, Dr. Shereen, because uh, it is really, really heartbreaking to note mm -hmm. that uh, with all the things that are happening here in, in uh, the, uh, the adult population, they are also happening among our very young children. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it, it may uh, mean that there could be something that families could do, right? 
Mm -hmm. So uh, it basically starts uh, with family, with at home. So can you comment some more about this? Sure. You know, yes, it certainly does start at home. And, and I, I want to, you know, there was a time pre motherhood and post motherhood, I would have had two different answers. <laughs> I'll just be transparent with that. You know, being a parent changes how, and also for me changes sensitivity, even if you're a working parent, um, it can become challenging. I can understand why it's sometimes easy for some parents to go to that, you know, golden arches or want to get something very quick as opposed to taking the time to say, okay, you know what, I want to plan a menu. I want to um, take the time to prepare foods in their traditional ways. And it can be, you know, I'm, I'm not going to lie, it can be very challenging when you're faced with working, providing the family, and especially if you're a single mom. And this is, a, again, a global dynamic. But we have to start saying, okay, what truly is important? And being gracious with yourself to say, okay, you know, I may not get it right all the time, but I always encourage parents and to try to do it the right, as best as you can, 80% of the time. I call it the 80-20 rule, 80% of the time, and you'll give yourself grace with the remaining 20. And I believe the Lord will take care of the difference um, in there. And have the children also, this is one thing I found, while I was a professor at Morgan State University some years ago, I developed, I was a co-founder in what we called COVID, um, COVID, which is Community Organic Vegetable Garden. And we found that when children got involved with seeing where, where foods come from and where they're growing, they change how they want to consume, like when they're taking part in it. And so, so if you if there's a possibility to either whether you have a little small garden or you know some type of agriculture near your house, or even if it's just some kind of little plot somewhere to grow something, it changes how children view and experience their, their foods. Um, and also just being creative, asking, you know, getting kids involved, say, hey, what are your favorite, you know, fruits? Ask them, which ones do they like? Which ones do they dislike? If there's some that they dislike, don't make a big deal about it. Find the ones that they enjoy. And I encourage this with adults as well. Find the ones that they enjoy and keep incorporating them in your meals on a regular basis and finding creative ways to, um, to do your best. Uh, with, Because again, we just came out of a pandemic and work, I mean, th there's a lot. And so I encourage families, be creative, you know, try to maintain, you know, as much whole food plant based as much as possible. So, um, you know, if you're having a salad, don't just think of it as a salad, you know, I think of it as a bowl of life, you know, put as many greens, have put beans in there, you know, have, let kids say, okay, what do you want to put in this today? And I don't, don't label it. Like, what do you want to, there's, you know, put it on the table and say, these are some, you know, use a parent, put them out there and let them pick and let them make it and it, let them call it what it is. But you know, that what's being placed, either it's on the pan or the plate, food choices that are compatible with our design. And that's, those are just some of my recommendations. Um, I hope that's helpful. Yeah, and it's good that you mentioned that because, you know, giving vegetables and fruits to children have become so challenging, you know. Uh, as a parent uh, myself with four girls, three girls in a row, and then the youngest is uh, eight years um, uh, who came later from the third one. And, and so uh, those three were born in the Philippines and they are fond of fruits and vegetables as so we used to coming fresh from the garden. But then the bigger challenge for us is our youngest daughter, which uh, at first she didn't like. She didn't like those fresh fruits and vegetables. And then we had to introduce and it's good that you recommended that in before you even could feed the child with any that is uh, high in sugar, you have to feed him or her with vegetables first. Right, absolutely, because of the palate. And one thing I just, and I just learned this, and I just, if I may share this one experience, and it was really an eye-opener and humbling for me. I was getting a little, I, I'll just be transparent here, a little frustrated because my daughter, she wasn't eating um, the cat, she wasn't eating carrots. and. And I kept saying, you know, you need to eat them. And I was, and she loved just about most foods prepared, but it's just the carrot. She would, wouldn't would want to consume the um, carrots that were cooked on the stove, like, you know, boiled or whether they were heated. And she said to me, Ma, she said to me the other day when she was able to express, she says, mommy, I like my carrots crunchy and raw. I don't like them cooked. That was actually a paradigm shift for me, not just from a child, but what that said to me was, People have preferences. They may not like something under one circumstance, but they, if you give them a chance to express and find out what their, you know, what, what, what their bend is or what they're thinking, you actually may learn 
great deal. That it's not that they dislike it. They just may dislike the preparation. And truthfully, carrots in their raw, raw format are actually preferred and better than in the cook. Once she said that to me, I said, wow, not only do I need to do more listening to you, but also recognize that a no is not necessarily a no. It's just a, ye a yes in a different format. Yeah, I don't know if uh, my co-hosts, uh, maybe uh, Professor Isaac and uh, Mr. Gami have questions uh, for Dr. Shireen. This is just uh, yeah, very I interesting. Just, I just have to commend uh, the presentation. It's very, very good. Although um, for us, like lay persons in the field of nutrition, we're not so familiar with the terms. And, and uh, I, I'm sure that uh, a lot of people that are listening to us all over the globe may have the, some difficulty in remembering the, the technical terms. So I'm, I'm thinking if there is a simpler way, a rule of thumb for us to remember uh, Dr. Shireen on, on, on the five, I think it's seven, uh, all of the seven um, uh, food additives, artificial food additives that we need to avoid because you know, in this in this world where everything seems to be packaged, and uh, there is a good chance that there is an additive in there. And this presentation this evening has has uh, given me and other viewers as well an insight that we have to be very careful. It's just that uh, it's quite challenging for us to identify even the food colorings because they are even coded with uh, numbers. So uh, perhaps uh, with with the coordination with uh, Dr. Tamayo, we can be able to um, provide a certain kind of a a pamphlet, perhaps just one page of this. Uh, just, 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 just my thought, because um, Dr. Shireen is very, uh, very wise in saying that uh, food additives are by itself. It's not intrinsically bad because uh, food needs to be preserved. Food needs to be tasty as well. They need to be transported safely, and so there has to be a balance between making the food safe for its preservation and uh, for it to be to be healthy and and not dangerous. So um, I think it would be very practical for us, for those like myself, to be able to remember um, that when I read the label, if labeled, if there's a sulfide there, if there's a trans fat there, I think I could remember only three out of the seven. But at least, at least it's getting there. It's getting there, doctor. And thank you so much. Um, perhaps I another question. Wanted, may, I, may I answer a question? May I give a recommendation? Something that's sure, very sure, practical to that? Um, and I'm, I'm so glad you asked that question. What I often recommend is yes, those were a lot of you know terms um, that may not be lay friendly. When you pick up a food label, just for the average person, this is anywhere in the world because there are food labels for the most part on packaged foods. So anytime a food is processed, or so if you take an apple, cut it up and sell it, you have to put it in a, in a plastic, you have to put a label on it. Once it's been changed from its original state, it's considered a processed food and has to have a label. So my recommendation is when you look at the food label and the ingredients at the bottom, Usually it's in descending order. What that means is the first the first ingredients that are listed are usually in the most abundant. And when you go and read continually go to the end, that means those are the least abundant. So the ones that are at the top are the most in the food. As you go down and read the, you know, the ingredients, the ones that are at the bottom are the, are the least. So if you can, when you're reading and you when you pick up a process, a packaged food, you automatically know it's it's a packaged food, so it's gone through processing. The first five ingredients, the first five ingredients, my hope and prayer is that those will be foods, those will be words, excuse me, that you're familiar with. The first five ingredients are words that you're familiar with. If the next five are a little more chemistry for you, then, you know, that's what you pray about it. You know, you try to, you know, make sure there's no trans fat. I'm just going to keep, that's one thing I'm going to stand on the mountaintops with, avoid trans fat as, at all costs. But if those first five ingredients can be words you can pronounce and you're familiar with, and this remainder may have some chem, and not all chemical terms are bad, like ascorbic acid is just the chemical term for vitamin C. So not every chemical term is adverse or bad, but first five, mm -hmm. pronounce, the remaining five plus, if you can't, then you're a little safer. But if those first five start with albuterate, you know, polyphenol, glycophen, and it's, it says that it's a cake or it says it's a biscuit, and the first word is not flour, and the, but the first word is like polyphenol, ascorbic, put it down. That's, a, that's some guidance. You know, if it's that's bread. A if, that's a big one. That's an yeah. and a, excellent advice, though. Yeah. So that's Another follow-up question. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, don't, don't, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, I, one of the arguments that I find when I get to this with other some rather philosophical friends is that they say, okay, uh, the, 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 um, 
we, we call it BFAD in the Philippines, the Bureau of uh, Food and Drugs Administration. Uh, you mentioned the, the agency, the government agency earlier. I didn't quite get that. And they say if it passed through this uh, this very strict government uh, approving body, then it's uh, considered to be healthy. And so what what do we say to that um, kind of argument? Doc? And I'm just going, and a great question. So it's considered safe, not necessarily mm -hmm. healthy. That's what they say, yeah. And there's a distinction between safe and healthy. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> Big distinction, which is why those, that's why legally the term is safe. Mm. Yeah, so the, we have what we call the giras or the grass, as we know, generally yeah. recognized as safe. And basically, the, even those that uh, Dr. Shirin mentioned are actually all under uh, the giras. That's why the Bureau of Food and Drugs Administration have uh, given permission for the food industries to make use of all those food additives because they are considered as the uh, grass or giras as uh, the others would call generally recognized as safe but basically it's actually an exercise of our own choice and i like the practicality that dr shirin mentioned because the first five if they are very familiar with you then you may take it but those that uh, the, if the first five are not so familiar, like they they sound like chemistry or biochemistry or what, then it would be wise not to take it. Yes, because the first one in the list is the most abundant of all the ingredients in that particular food. Yeah, ju just uh, maybe our other co-hosts may have questions, but there is one question in our chat. Uh, it says here, doesn't microwaving destroy food uh, food nutrients? Because uh, Dr. Cherin mentioned about microwaving somewhere in uh, 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 where was that? Where you use microwaving here in your recommendation, Dr. Cherin? Uh, and not, uh, not microwaving plastics in plastic wrappers, if I remember it right. Do not oh, microwave okay, yeah. in plastic containers. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but microwaving being the food per se, according to the question, as I understand, is it uh, recommended or not recommended? Because the others would say it could be cancer uh, promoting or something like the nutrients may be totally destroyed. Can you uh, uh, say something about this, Dr. Sharin? Certainly. Um, and usually questions like that are a little larger than what the what. Um, being asked. And so indulge me as I kind of address it. I always go through the spectrum of what I call good, better, best. Ideally, not heating foods, like eating foods in the original state is ideal because you haven't tampered with the heat of um, affecting or changing the enzymes or breaking down the nutrient composition. So for example, I'll, I'll use um, I'll use kale. I love kale. I'll just use it as an illustration here. Kale and it's, you know, uncooked has phenomenal benefits. Anytime you heat a food or a, a, let's say a fruit or a vegetable or grain, you heat it, you change the structure of it. So whether the heat is on the stove, whether the heat is in the oven or whether the heat is in the microwave and microwaves heat from inside out, whereas on the stove, you're heating from the outside in. It's a different uh, dynamic there. So anytime you heat a food, you potentially can leach or like to lose nutrients, whether it's in the stove, whether it's on the, on the oven or whether it's in the microwave, you will actually potentially lose some nutrients. So for example, if you're boiling a vegetable, I always say save the water because the water often has a lot of the nutrients and then use it for a soup or stew and don't discard it if, if at all possible. Now microwaving again is another type of heating. It's a dip, it, it, the idea of microwaving because of what it emits is has concerns and legitimate concerns and danger versus more so than what it's doing to the food itself. So it's more the emission, what comes from the microwave versus the actual um, mechanism of how foods are heated in the microwave itself. So is it, do you lose nutrients in microwaving foods? Yes, you certainly do because you are, so let's say you prepare food from scratch and then you put it in the refrigerator or you're cooling and then you wanna reheat it. I always say, if you have the time, it's better to reheat it on the stove 
than the microwave. But once you heat a food, you are going to, just by default of heating a food, you are going to minimize some of the nutrients regardless of how you're heating. Was that helpful? Yes, uh, surely, yeah. right, yes. A anything that you can do with the food, even with the slicing, minimal processing is actually going to alter the food chemistry. Like, uh, for example, if you are going to slice uh, apple, of course, you are exposing uh, the uh, inside of the fruit to the external environment, and this could cause uh, oxidation reaction and so on and so forth, that it may, to a certain extent, compromise the nutrients of the food. How much more if you are going to heat it, uh, either as the Dr. Shirin mentioned, um, from boiling to maybe uh, air frying, maybe <laughs> and yeah. microwaving and other things, uh, grilling, broiling, and some other things. This could actually, to a certain extent, destroy the nutrients of the food. But I don't know, maybe Dr. Sherin will, will tell uh, which one is the worst. Is it microwave, between microwaving and bo boiling? <laughs> Again, good, better, best, you know, stovetop convection is ideal. It's better than microwaving. But I also know this, and I, I always look through the lens of, okay, what is best? Yes, on the stove, preparing on the stove, boiling is better than frying. Those are both better than microwaving. However, we live in a society and I recognize, every, you know, we're talking globally, people are in different places in their lives. And sometimes you have to, because of the nature of your, your world and your life, you got a microwave. Because let's say you, I mean, you have to look at your life and in, in, in kind of in a whole sense. And, and I, and that's why sometimes I'm reluctant to just say, okay, well, yes, microwaving is bad. Well, you know, it's not the best. If you can, it's preferred to cook on the stove, but if you're unable to, and you need to feed your children, you know, make sure there's a, a salad there, you know, make sure that there's some other whole food that's there to maybe counteract some of the nutrient loss from the microwave. And that's what I do when I consult with individuals or patients or clients, I look at their whole life and seeing, okay, this is what is best, but now look at, let me look at your day to day. What is your job? What is your, what are your daily responsibilities? You know, how, what is your prayer life? What is your spiritual life? Like, you know, how are, are you dealing with um, a healthy day to day life? Um, and, and these are important because the whole idea of having a microwave is because it makes things a little faster and more convenient. Um, is it the best? No, it isn't. And I have to be upfront with that, but can you incorporate it in a healthy lifestyle, well, you certainly can. It's just, I give tips on how to, to do that. But stove is better, absolutely. Um, but we live in a world where a lot of people do use the microwave. Um, I will say this, if you are gonna use microwave, use paper or glass, please do not use plastic. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I don't know if uh, Pastor uh, Maxwell has any questions or maybe our lead host, uh, Professor Isaac, you may have questions. Uh, yes, I do. I was going to allow Maxwell to go first. Maxwell, you can go first. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Shere, for sharing with us this um, in this program. Um, my question is actually on nitrates. You know, like you rightly said, they are used to preserve foods. So how can we really avoid that? Because mere looking at it, it is not, um, it seems it is not totally wrong, but how can we avoid it? Secondly, um, what is your advice to university students who like processed foods? So what kind of advice can you give us? Thank you. Well, I, I heard your second question. I unfortunately, I didn't hear the first. Um, so I will ask, I don't know if time will allow you to repeat the first question. I'd be happy to answer both. I just didn't hear the first. Okay, I'm talking about nitrates. Like you, like you rightly said, that um, they are used to serve food. So okay. how can we really avoid that? So nitrates are one type of preservative. They're not in all. So one way is 
wines and as faith we don't ascribe to them and i won't go to on that controversial because i believe wine is the blood of the grape the juice from the grape but when you get into the alcoholic wines wines tend to have high levels of sulfate in them so avoid wines uh, another type of source of nitrates are in dried fruits um, there are companies that make dried fruits that do not use sulfites in them as a drying agent um, and if you are going to you know, consume dry fruits that, you know, just occasionally, again, dry fruits are more concentrated foods. It's better to have them uh, to consume fruits in their whole state, you know, uh, or even frozen and not dried. Again, dried can be used occasionally, um, but nitrates tend to be a preservative, preservative in certain foods. It's not throughout all the food supply. So again, looking at the food label, um, avoiding wine consumption, because that's a size of nitrates and um, dried fruits that have um, sulfites in them. Thankfully, they're no longer um, coated, coating the f fruits and vegetables with sulfites. So that's nitrates, excuse me. So that's one way you can, uh, um, you won't have to worry about that. Uh, I hope that answered that question for you. Um, the other answer is a question you said as far as being a college student. And I get this a lot because I'm at a university. And I think I heard you ask, what is a university student to do for just a uh, healthy, what, what, I'm, I missed that part again. I'm so sorry if you don't mind asking the second part. Yeah, I'm talking about your, your advice to university students who like processed foods. So got it. Okay. since it seems, um, okay, you got it now. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So, yeah. you know, college life can be challenging, but I often say, you know, we live, we eat to live, not live to eat. And I know for college students, that's a tough one because you're studying and you have all these other dynamics going on away from home or um, you know, under lots of stress and just start sometimes studying late. And when you're up late, it's easy to grab things you know, that you put in your mouth to keep yourself alert. And so my recommendation is if there is a dining hall on the campus, and a lot of times students, they don't always look favorably <laughs> on the dining hall, but I recommend giving it a chance and and looking, trying to see if there are some things that you can take to go, like literally th uh, fruits that you like, as opposed to the pro you know process. Finding some um, foods that are pre prepared that you can take with you from the dining hall. Um, again, I don't know if students have transportation if they're able to get off campus. Um, and your microwave, and again, I know this kind of goes against what we were just talking about, but sometimes in college dorms, the microwave is the use of, you know, the, the heating tool of choice. Um, you know, this, and this may sound kind of controversial, but ramen noodles, you can do a lot with ramen noodles, just the noodle and water and adding, you know, canned vegetables to it. You can actually make ramen noodles very healthy uh, and it's repackaged, but just water and the noodle and really hooking it up, I should say, with um, vegetables in there and even adding maybe some tofu um, or some mm -hmm. other um, protein source, some beans, legumes. You can actually go to town with just the ramen noodles on a low budget. Um, it's amazing how even certain chefs are re, um, reinventing the ramen noodles, so to speak. But another thing, uh, as far as pa you know, processed foods, if you're going to go with processed foods like chips and things of that nature, there are companies now that are making healthier options and healthier choices. Um, so I understand, you know, in the college life, sometimes you want to grab a bag of something. Look for healthier options, healthier choices. And so how do you do that? Well, you know, look for when you read the label, make sure it doesn't say, you know, hydrogenated fat. Make sure it's lower in salt. Um, these are the things that obviously for many taste good, but you, you kind of have to look at the short term and the long term. Yes, you're going to be in college for a certain number of years, but you want to take care of your vessel in a way that it will last you, um, you know, the years after. I don't know if that's the answer you're looking for, um, but I'm hoping that gives you some, some guidance. Um, and, you know, don't neglect um, even pre-prepared, uh, you know, cut fruits in the, in the dining hall. Sometimes certain schools will have uh, salad bars, you know, have ex really salad bars that I see so many students just walk past. And the salad bar can be your ally. It can be your, it literally, you can do so much with at a salad bar and just kind of get out the idea of that salads are for, you know, you can do some, um, 
mixing a lot. I mean, making sure you find a legume, uh, like a chickpea or bean and making that the base and really just adding so many different things to a salad that can actually, I don't even call them salads anymore. I just call it a bowl of goodness that crunches because you can do so much with it. Mm -hmm. Just because, you know, when people hear salad, they think it's, you know, it's not a, a meal. You can actually create a meal, a full meal with greens and beans. Those are my two things, greens and beans. And then you just add all other things that you want. And that can be done in college, you know, for college students as well. Um, don't shy away from even prepackaged fruits and prepackaged salads. Sometimes those can kind of get you, give you some advantages. Um, I hope those tips can, are giving you some guidance um, that will helpful, Pastor Matt. Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Um, I, I think uh, Pastor Mike actually asked some of the questions that I really wanted to ask. But then my my uh, my question would go to, I'm into um, natural things. Like um, I think I've there's a time where I stepped away from um, artificial additives and everything. And um, for me, it was easy for sugar. You know, like stopping yeah. sugar was quite easy for me. And then on the savory part, it was a bit difficult because um, because if you're still a meat eater, that's like one of the compositions that kind of stops you from letting go, go of salt because you can't eat meat without salt and everything. So my question would be going back to the to the sugar part first, where you mentioned about the high fructose um, content. Like, how does that happen when when it's like a natural thing? You know, I want to understand how how do they turn the fructose into a higher concentrate that is harmful to us. It's a great question. So fructose, again, in its natural state, it's just the sugar that's in fruit. That's just how God designed it. But, um, and I don't know if I want to go into the full um, dialogue of how it's converted, but it's a chemical process where high fructose corn syrup can actually look like acrylic. It's like, it almost looks like a clear, sometimes it's yellow, sometimes it can be a, a clear, uh, very thick syrupy content. And manufacturers, there's, food science is a huge industry. Um, Professor Isaac, food science is a huge industry. And, you know, through food science experimentation, able to discover that you can change the structure of fructose and create a very intense, high potent type of syrup that is originally uh, originated with fructose, but converting it to this liquid that is almost 10 times the, the basic, you know, sweetening than the basic sugar. Um, and when something is even more sweet, people will gravitate and will consume foods that have that higher sweet, that sweeter content. Um, but it was, it's, it's a, it's a synthetic sugar. It's not a man-made. So it's not like um, it's something that's in high fructose corn syrup is not naturally found in foods. No, fructose is fructose fruit. Mm. Yeah. Fructose is naturally found in fruits, mangoes, praise the Lord strawberries, you know, mangoes, you know, pomegranates, that ha naturally has fructose. But when manufacturers or food scientists change fructose and, you know, make some chemical ch changes, they create a new compound called high fructose corn syrup. And it's a liquid. And it's 10 times sweeter than fructose. Okay, so high and fructose is not natural. Fructose is natural. I'll say that again, just for the viewers and listeners. High fructose corn syrup is not natural. It's artificial. It's synthetic. Fructose is natural. It is naturally found in fruits. Yes, um, and that's can make a follow, follow up for that, Doc. Like, like, and not, not um, it's too much of a good thing, also a bad thing. When you say that the the, the fructose that we find in natural in its natural form, form in mangoes and strawberries. When, when when we ingest too much of that, of course, uh, common common judgment would dictate that it's going to be bad for you as well. And if you have oh. some kind of diabetes, is that is that a rule or something? Well, you know, you I would, sure. And and I and forgive me for maybe quoting our our, our sister who founded a church, Ellen White. You know, abstaining from th you know things that you know having moderation and things that are good, and abstaining mm -hmm. in things that are harmful. You know, harmful. Okay. Water is wonderful, but you can actually die by over consuming too much water because you can throw your electrolytes. Electrolytes are your, um, they're the like sodium, potassium, they're the charged things in your body, for lack of better words, that keep your, we're like a battery, which is why you never lick a socket because you can get electrocuted. We act, actually have natural charges. It's that vital force that God has given us. But when you consume too much water, more than what your body, you can actually destroy your electrolytes and die. 
yeah. from the very thing that we need. So of course, if you're consuming, man, you know, tons and <laughs> all you're eating is mango and nothing else day after day after day, yeah. that's that's not what we were designed to. We were designed to consume a variety, which is why God gave us these beautiful eyes to see different colors and consume different colors. Um, now I know some parts of the world, you know, mangoes are consumed on a regular basis, and some people learn the hard way that you end up going to the bathroom quite a bit if you overconsume, you know, certain fruits. Um, but generally speaking, if you are diabetic or have to, you're diagnosed with type two diabetes or even a type one, um, you know, it's best to. It's, you can't. I, I will say this: you don't. You, you don't have to stop consuming fruits. However, you have to consume them differently and in different amounts. And working awesome. with a healthcare provider for that. Thank, you. Uh, Thank sure. you for that. Because a lot Absolutely. of people are saying that if it's fruits, it's fine. It's it's not even having any additives. But thank you for that. That there are yes. some limitations. Even Absolutely. To and I believe, you know, if God made it, it's best. Consume it. But remember, with all things, you want to have a variety. And not consuming the same okay. thing over and over and over and over again to excess. Okay. I have, I have one more last question um, in terms of, um, additional tips on how people can avoid um, the additives that are harmful to us. Is there any is there any visible way you can see that something is not good for you? Maybe maybe you might not understand everything that has been mentioned today, but is there any physical way that you can visibly see that this food is not right? For instance, maybe the color. Maybe there may be for someone who's saying um, there are some natural colors you could actually see that if the food is just blue. You know, you need to think about it. Like, there, are there certain ways that you can visibly see that this could be not good for you, or it's always it has to be scientific? Like, yes, um, food that you that are in the whole state, and food that's in a package. I mean, if we're going to get down to answering your question, you have the apple and the apple pie. You have the blueberry and the blueberry muffin. You so blue food. Blue foods are not bad because blueberry that's what God originally made to have that color or um, for uh, give another example, like a Sava, you know, it's, it's a, a kind of a creamy color. Once you process a food, meaning it's gone through, it's you've taken it from its original state and done something to it and put it in a package, the game changes. So the minute you shift to, okay, now I'm consuming a packaged food. Once it's not packaged, you're pretty much okay. You know, I pick up a banana, you're good. But now if I'm having a banana pudding, and it's in a package, the game changes. You know, oats, oats are wonderful. We eat oatmeal every, almost every morning. But if I'm now putting the oat into an oat bar that's in a package, it changes and how we have to think about it. So now, so to answer your question is, once something is in a package, we have to think differently. We know now that there's gonna be more things in there, more things in there that have to preserve it, that have to market it, you know, change the color. So to answer it is, if you're having something in a package, then you have to be a little wiser and saying, okay, now I have to look at this food differently. It's gone through a process. And if it's blue, it's because, and it's marketing blueberries, maybe it's uh, the blue is a little brighter because they've added a coloring to it. So if something seems like too bright <laughs> in a package, yeah, it might be a concern, concern there. If something seems too shiny in a package, you know, and again, once you're in a package mode, you have to realize that there are things added to maintain its integrity, maintain its texture, maintain its consistency, maintain its transport to maintain, you know, to get it from one point place to another. I'll share a story. I, I love aloe juice. And this kind of will answer your question as well. Um, I purchased it was a big bottle and was an aloe and it said watermelon flavor. And I'm always liking to experiment. I started doing more of that after I stopped nursing some years ago. I said, let me experiment nursing my daughter. And I remember looking at, and I said to myself, this color just looks, doesn't look like watermelon. I love aloe and I, and I, you know, but I want to taste it. It was a different, I can't remember what the product was, but I said, let me look on the back of the label because something triggered that the color was off. It just seemed a little too artificial. When I looked on the back at the, and I read the ingredients that the first level was, the first word was aloe and water and then some sucralose, uh, sugar. But then there was a word that I said, what is that? And it's, it was um, chitin, something, C-H-I-T-A-N. And I did my research on what it was and I was a little mortified because I said, oh, this is what they used to color. And it's basically um, a food coloring that's banned in the US, but used in other parts of the world. It's a red bug, it's an insect that is um, powdered 
and used to create a red coloring. And so that's where, again, the Lord, Holy Spirit, you, you say, you know, what sometimes you just have to look and say, mm, something doesn't seem right about that. Read the back, and do your research. That's the best I can answer that one. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, and one, one thing that uh, we can think about is the closer you are to nature, the better. That's right. Yes. So uh, we, we uh, our, our, the thing that uh, we would like to promote basically is uh, whole foods, plant-based diet, right. because we are closer to nature. And, but of course, it's not always a guarantee that um, you are getting all the nutrients that you need. That's why Dr. Shirin mentioned that you also have to consider variety. Variety, it's not just mangoes over and over again, not just grapes over and over, but you have to consider that there should be other, other foods that should be added to your uh, main course of your meal. So if it is vegetables, there could be a variety. Different colors would mean different nutrients that are represented in the food. Wow. So very enlightening, Dr. Shireen. We, I hope that uh, we can go on and on and on and on with yeah. this. And this, uh, this is just very enlightening and very interesting to our audience. But I don't know if there are some things that uh, um, or you would like to share with our viewers, Dr. Shireen, maybe uh, some pieces of advice uh, to close the the presentation. Sure, and thank you for that question, that important question. You know, I know everyone is kind of looking for that answer of what to do and what not to eat. And I believe God has already given us the original plan and guidance for what we should be consuming. But then life happens and we, we live in different parts of the world where different foods are available and our lifestyles are varied. So I always encourage individuals, as simple as this sounds, pray about your food choices. Ask God to give you the wisdom and insight and direction on, you know, is this really good for me? Is this, and he will, uh, he cares about all things. And this is really not oversimplifying it. Really pray and ask God, you know, give me direction on what are the best things to consume. And I always often say, you know, it's a quote that I, and I'm forgetting the professor I got this from, I wish I can give him credit, but it's to, and it's a very simple quote, eat not too much, mostly plants and drink lots of water. As simple as that sounds, that is a foundation for really healthy food choices. Eat, so not restricting, you know, we, we were designed, we were given teeth, we have a digestive system with acid to break down protein. Our anatomy speaks to the glory of God and speaks to the foods we can consume. Carbohydrates are digested in the mouth, you know, fruits, vegetables, as proteins are digested in the stomach, fats are digested in the small intestine and large intestine, small intestine. So it shows just by design, the foods we're supposed to be consuming. But Eat not too much, you know, to 80%, not till your you know, belly pops open, but eat to satisfaction. Mostly plants, meaning, you know, things that are in their natural sources. Obviously, that may not be applicable to everyone in the world. Some people I'm speaking to are meat eaters, some are vegan through the spectrum, even in our faith. But try to make sure that when you put foods on their plate, they're compatible with foods that are in their life, their whole food state as much as possible. Even if you are having an animal source or a plant-based protein source, mostly plant and consume as much water as possible. Um, yeah, we're 70% water, our brains dependent on water. This is what we know. But if those simple principles, eat, not too much, mostly plants, consume water and pray and ask God for this, this you know, direction. And if you need you know, additional, there's nothing wrong with going to see a registered dietitian or a professional to give you some extra advice on one-on-one -on -one, you know, um, consultation on, on how to you know, make daily choices on menu planning. Um, and I'm really a big advocate of that. We go to doctors for a lot of things when we have you know, healthcare. I always recommend if there are nutrition professionals in your area, set up an appointment with them, talk to them, get some, you know, have, take them out to lunch or something, <laughs> you know, um, seek their advice. Um, yeah, and thank you for mentioning that, Dr. Shireen. Could you please share to our uh, viewers uh, your contact number, maybe how they are able to get in touch with you? Sure, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, my email address is sfraser, S is in Sam, Fraser, F-R-A-S-E-R, at oakwood.edu. That's S. Fraser at oakwood.edu. And my number is 256 726 7219. 
That's 256-726-7219. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much, Dr. Shereen. Um, today was a very eye-opening um, presentation. And this is always my favorite, but sometimes I get uh, stuck in the terms and then you get tired of, of the chloro something and everything and then everything else. But I just want to say thank you for, for gracing us today. Uh, with the presentation and like always we're going to see your face most times so that means we are going to be rich with knowledge once more again and I want to thank you deeply and I also want to thank the viewers for for also watching and I believe you're watching the stream now thank you so much and if you're going to watch the stream later on uh, be blessed as well share with your friends like our page and um, yes stay healthy live healthy and I'm going to ask uh, Pastor Mac to give us a closing prayer, but then before he does that, yes, I'm going to ask uh, Gami to to give us um, an insight of what we're going to discuss about next week. Hello. Yeah. Um, before I do that, I think uh, Dr. Tomai is here to be doing more of an elaboration of that. Uh, let me just also share with all our viewers some of the takeaways or what really sticks in my mind after the wonderful presentation today. Now, what I what I know to be the best practice is to stay close to nature, go natural as possible. But because of the lifestyle that we have, for example, we have kids who like uh, like, like the busy you know school run as we have it in the UK. You have to have some kind of Kellogg's for us here <laughs> somehow. We're trying to make it. Uh, but but what I what I really learned is to read the labels now. I would try to read the labels, and I'm starting to read now. And so I have um, rice and sugar, glucose, zero, fat reduced cocoa powder. These are actually safe, I think. But I know in my mind that we are supposed to be shifting a little more to a more natural uh, diet. And uh, but at least at this point, we we can be safe and going towards good, getting to best. Uh, Dr. Tomayo, can you comment on what's we're, what, what the topic we're we going to do next week? Yes, uh, Mr. Gami. Yeah, but before I do that, I would like to uh, reiterate the one that uh, Dr. Shireen mentioned as my takeaway for this presentation, ask for wisdom. If you don't, don't know, pray for wisdom that God will give you wisdom in order for you to uh, make a good choice for yourself, a healthy choice that will praise the Lord, that will honor the giver of life. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Shireen. And yes, for next week, we will have uh, the topic, uh, May 17, Nature's Ammunitions Against Cancer. How do you like that? Uh, this You should not miss this because this is one of the things that uh, uh, people are being challenged in their health, cancer of any forms. So we will go look into nature's ammunitions against cancer. So we will have a presenter as well uh, for this topic. And please, please don't ever, ever miss this presentation. And again, we thank you so much, Dr. Shireen. It has been a, a pleasure and an honor to have you here with us as part of our health team now. Now, you are now an official part of our health top team. Oh, Thank you that's so much, awesome. Dr. Shireen. Thank mm -hmm. you. And of course, to uh, Pastor Maxwell. Uh, my first time to meet with uh, Pastor Maxwell, and I'm just so glad that you joined us, Pastor Maxwell. And of course, to our lead host, uh, Professor Isaac, and our regular co-host, uh, Mr. Gami Valencia. You have contributed so much since the time that you joined us. Uh, we are just so thankful that you have made our presentations a much more alive and uh, some insights coming from you. And we are so grateful. And of course, we thank God for allowing this format in order for us, platform in order for us to convey the health message of the Lord to all the world. And God bless you. God bless us all. So I give back to uh, 
uh, Professor Isaac, and he has some closing remarks before we finish. Yes, I, I want us to close in, 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 in prayer and also um, to thank people once again and to remind uh, our viewers that we are not of our own, but we are bought with the price and the blood of Jesus Christ and we're created by God and health is a choice. Let us then choose to be healthy. Um, Pastor Mark, can you give us a closing prayer? All right, let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege you've given to us to study with Dr. Shirin. Thank you for your love and grace. Help us to be healthy. Help us to observe the health principles that can help us to have a healthy life. Bless our viewers today. Bless us individually. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, uh, Thank Pastor you so much. Paul. Amen. Yes, and I recognize, uh, I, I think Pastor Jiwon Moon is here with us. Actually, Pastor Jiwon uh, uh, is uh, the one who initiated uh, Jesus Live that I owe. And uh, thank you for joining us as well, Dr. Jiwon Moon, and to all our participants today. Thank you, and God bless. Okay, so as Jesus Live, we have to. Um, we live with the motto that we live by. Right. Um, uh, as Jesus Live, we are prayer warriors, ambassadors of love, fearless leaders, and powerful missionaries. Thank you so much, everyone, from um, Isaac Yami and the co-host, Jesus Live team, it is bye for now. Bye, everyone.